even skepticism and trepidation. On this issue, Congress might well heed the time-honored Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm. As the Committee of Jurisdiction over Youth, Amateur, Collegiate, and Professional Sports, this committee seeks expert advice today as we decide which direction we begin to take for congressional action on the issue of NIL compensation in college sports. More than 30 states have adopted, introduced, or signaled plans to introduce legislation allowing for student athletes to be compensated for the use of their NIL. I believe my colleagues recognize the need to avoid differences among the states by having a uniform set of standards by which our collegiate student athletes compete, a set of uniform standards that will strive for a level playing field. At the same time, we must recognize that any standards for the compensation of NIL must also provide protections for students, schools, and associations, particularly for the student athletes. We must be mindful of the law of unintended consequences. Human nature being what it is, we need to realize that some of our fellow mortals will seek and likely find loopholes for an unfair advantage. Over the last four months, I've spent hours on the phone with university presidents, athletic directors, and former collegiate athletes to help understand the current collegiate student athlete system and how to approach a national policy on NIL. As part of that process and in preparation for this hearing, I sent a list of 20 questions to 50 collegiate associations, conferences, universities, colleges, and service academies. We have summarized those responses and put that information on the committee's website. Without objection, I will enter that summary document into the record at this point. Hearing none, that will be done. In May, the NCAA Board of Governors Working Group issued a report on student athlete compensation. The modernization of rules related to NIL commercialization and recommendations to Congress. We are grateful to have that input as well, and I ask unanimous consent to insert that into the record also. Without objection, it will be done. In almost every discussion I've had, the topic inevitably turns to a look at the many ways this issue might be abused or go awry. For example, will high school athletes choose to attend a university in a large media market because they believe it will generate more NIL value? How will universities or their supporters be prevented from manipulation of NIL contracts in the recruiting process? Will businesses invest in student athlete NIL rights to promote a legitimate business or as an avenue to create access to athletes, coaches, and athletic programs? Will it be easier or harder for the star player on a team to put the team first, even when showcasing individual talent may increase NIL income? Will NIL result in a rise in student athlete transfers to universities in bigger advertising markets? How will third parties contracting with student athletes be regulated? And how will that impact schools' ability to ensure compliance and enforcement of NCAA rules? Is an 18-year-old emotionally and financially prepared to make all the choices required to enter into NIL contracts? What will be the impact of the student's academic obligations? Will permitting compensation for NIL further widen the gap between the haves and the have-nots among institutions of higher learning? And what about the effect on Title, on title IX and women's sports? The list goes on and on. Let me uh, single out Senator Moran for taking the first steps on this issue by holding a subcommittee hearing on NIL earlier this year. I know he shares with me the sense of importance and urgency this issue demands. I look forward to working with him and all of the members of the Commerce Committee as we move forward to seek a, a solution. Many questions remain. I hope our committee will gain a better understanding of these complicated issues and the challenging challenges before us by means of these expert witnesses today. Let me again thank them for being here and recognize my dear friend and colleague, Ranking Member Cantwell, for her opening remarks. Senator Cantwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for that uh, long and thoughtful statement and a little bit of reminiscing about your own experiences. 
I consider myself a sports fan and definitely a collegial sports fan, but certainly uh, one that sides with wanting to have amateur athleticism and to make sure that we're keeping amateur athleticism. If anything, I feel like we should be doing more as a committee in our oversight of the violations of that athleticism and amateurism that occur all the time and uh, mark me down as not a fan of one and done, but somebody who really believes in the collegial system, as you said, of giving athletes an experience of leadership, teamwork, uh, building all sorts of character that I hope that we can continue to preserve as we look at this legislation. And I want to thank our witnesses for being here today, too. I know you come from a breadth and depth of experiences on these issues. Um, at the outset, I hope that we have a chance to talk about the current health care crisis as we are moving closer to the beginning of the academic year and uh, know that the pandemic is not relenting. I want to make sure we're putting into place safeguards to protect our student athletes as we look forward to what the collegial environment might be this fall. So I'll have a chance to ask people about this. This issue of compensation for student athletes is a complex one, as the chairman just mentioned, with strong feelings on both sides and growing legal battles in the courtrooms and state legislatures around the country. Despite its complexity, it is impossible to ignore the simple facts that these athletes do produce billions of dollars of value for the NCAA and member institutions and aren't able to market themselves as other st athletes, students would be. So the status quo is especially jarring as we look at this national reckoning on racial justice and civil rights issues and want to understand the impacts of uh, the NIL on all athletes. So I look forward to the discussion and potential solutions that we're going to talk about today. I am not a fan of an NCAA uh, antitrust exemption. Um, I uh, think that quashing all momentum for change with this blunt legal instrument is both unnecessary and ill-advised. Similarly, I oppose the Congress fully deferring to the NCAA um, on just coming up with the rules on name, image, and likeness. I think Congress should not abdicate its role, and I think the chairman's very thoughtful discussion and hard work on this shows that we need to have some input and oversight to make sure it's done right. The chairman just articulated a long list of complexity to the issue, which I very much appreciate his understanding and uh, the delicate balance that so many institutions have already tried to achieve by complying with the rules that are on the books today. And so I agree with the chairman that we don't want to see a new system in which violations would occur because somebody uh, sees a new avenue to promote uh, a, a, a competitive edge uh, in what is hopefully as balanced as we can get. But again, like I said, I think we should have more oversight on these issues. So how can we find a solution? that preserves both the character of college sports while also providing athletes with well-deserved rights. So, as I said, I believe in preserving amateurism and that athletes would be able to grow. Um, and I look forward to hearing Professor Kohler's comments on this issue and exactly how we can achieve this. I believe Congress should take the time to get this right. Um, it must be an open process. Hundreds of thousands of current athletes and millions of future athletes and their families are depending on it. And as the chairman said, this is a long tradition. It's part of our culture. Uh, these institutions, these, ath these athletic events, and we don't want to turn them into one more uh, avenue of, again, people just gaming a system on behalf of the athletes and then leaving the athletes again without uh, their own recourse. So I look forward to seeing this set of uh, solutions that we can agree on. And I hope that um, we can also at some point in time, Mr. Chairman, look more closely at mechanisms to ensure that female athletes have the same opportunity to earn compensation as their male colleagues. I think this is an important issue that deserves its own hearing and deserves its own focus, and hopefully we can get to that at some future date. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator Cantwell. And uh, now the written statements by all five of our witnesses will be entered into the record. Um,
in their entirety. We ask each witness to summarize their testimony in five minutes. Uh, and of course, um, Mr. Winston will, uh, will be joining us remotely. So we'll just begin uh, at uh, the left end of the table here uh, and uh, proceed down the table. Mr. Carter, you are recognized. Chairman Wicker, Ranking Member Cantwell, and the members of the Commerce Committee, good morning. My name is Keith Carter, and I'm the Vice Chancellor for Intercollegiate Athletics at the University of Mississippi, or more commonly referred to in athletic circles as Ole Miss. It's certainly an honor and a privilege to represent our great university, the Southeastern Conference, and other athletics directors and student athletes from across the country regarding name, image, and likeness. I would like to thank Senator Wicker for inviting me to testify today, and to everyone on the committee for your interest and the attention as we look, as we look to work together and answer your questions regarding this timely and critical issue for student athletes across the country, the need for a federal legislation that provides a uniform standard for name, image, and likeness na nationwide. I believe it is time for intercollegiate athletics to find a pathway forward. Legislation of this magnitude dealing with student athletes' personal image and how a compensation model could potentially be implemented must be done in a deliberate, thoughtful, and inclusive manner as it will shape the future of intercollegiate athletics. Athletics has been a vital part of my life since I was five years old. Growing up, I played baseball and basketball and ultimately had an opportunity to pursue a lifelong dream of competing at the highest level and fulfill a goal of completing my undergraduate degree. I was recruited by numerous schools and chose to be a student athlete at the University of Mississippi. When I played basketball at Ole Miss, I enjoyed the student athlete experience. While the schedule was rigorous, class, study hall, weight training, practice, and certainly competition, the student athlete experience shaped and molded me into the person that I am today. I also noticed during my time as a student athlete that my image and presence grew as I improved as a player and as my team became more successful. I was more recognized on campus and within the community. Interview requests increased, public appearances increased, and looking back, there would have been some level of market value for myself and my teammates. Today, the landscape has drastically changed. Whether it's social media, endorsements, or promotions, our student athletes have an unprecedented opportunity to capitalize on their name, image, and likeness, similar to thousands of other students with whom they attend college. After finishing my basketball career in Europe, I realized that I wanted to be back on a college campus working in an athletic department. Being a product of college athletics and having a real life story of how much my student athlete experience prepared me for the future, I felt a great obligation to give back. Special people such as coaches, administrators, professors, and countless others made a difference in my life. I wanted to use my experience as a student athlete and the lessons I learned along the way to help other young men and women achieve their goals. As I've moved into a leadership role as athletics director at my alma mater, I take great pride in listening to student athletes. I often get questions about the opportunity to benefit from their NIL in the same way that their non-athlete classmates do and the timing around any potential legislation. What does this model look like? It is obviously very complex, but we have an opportunity to shape what this could look like and ensure that unintended consequences do not cause long-lasting ripple effects on the ability to support our almost 400 student athletes. It is also vitally important that the governance structure be formed around federal legislation to ensure that each state, and therefore each university in the nation, has a uniform framework that continues to focus on education and the unique appeal of the current amateur model. Ensuring that our student athletes remain students and college athletics does not become pay for play, essentially another professional league, is essential in any potential solution. In my opinion, the preferred NIL system involves third-party compensation only, where colleges and universities are not allowed to pay for or otherwise facilitate NIL opportunities for their student athletes. Another important component of any new legislation must ensure that NIL opportunities are kept out of the recruiting process. Absent sufficient regulatory framework, NIL opportunities could be used as improper inducements during recruiting that could deter prospective student athletes from appropriately considering the academic and athletic opportunities a particular university may offer him or her. Regulation of agents and boosters in facilitating or offering NIL opportunities is also essential to a healthy framework. We come before you today to speak to the need for federal legislation to provide a baseline consistency for this much needed opportunity. Our goal is to work with you to put forth a national framework 
and first and foremost, protect the interests of all student athletes, both male and female, preserve the amateur model of intercollegiate athletics, safeguard the recruiting process, and ultimately provide equal opportunities for all student athletes to, benef to benefit from their NIL in the very same manner as their non-athlete classmates. Thank you again for this opportunity. Ultimately, we believe that more can and should be done for our student athletes, but it must be done in a way that continues to promote education and give consistent opportunities for all. I look forward to working toward a solution and enhancing the lives of our student athletes in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Carter. Dr. Drake, welcome. Yeah, I had a green light. I was uh, sorry. I was thinking go. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good to see you today. And Ranking Member Cantwell, good morning. Members of the committee, on behalf of the National Collegiate Athletic Association and the Ohio State University, where I was introduced as the chairman or the president emeritus, which has been the case for about 10 and a half hours. Um, so I, I appreciate my new uh, short-lived status. But I appreciate your interest in the important issue of com compensating student athletes related to name, image, and likeness. As a medical doctor and a 20-year member of the National Academy of Medicine, I have testified before, before as a subject area expert and am grateful to do so again. In spring 2019, interest in this issue heightened with the introduction of federal and state legislation that would permit student athletes to be compensated for use of their NIL. The NC2A Board of Governors established an NC2A federal and state legislation working group in May 2019 to examine this issue and develop recommendations. In October 2019, the NC2A Board of Governors unanimously supported the working group's recommendations and began the process of modernizing its rules to allow students participating in athletics the opportunity to benefit from the use of their NIL. As outlined in my testimony, the association's ability to move forward is hampered by three factors that we encourage you to focus on today. Specifically, we're asking for your partnership to preempt state bills on NIL with differing provisions and start dates so that there is a uniform standard and approach. Two, to protect universities and conferences from antitrust litigation that adversely affects our ability to effectively and efficiently support the evolving needs of student athletes. And three, to protect amateurism in college sports that is guided by longstanding values of education, opportunity, well-being, and fairness. I'd like to recognize that the attention that members of this committee and others in Congress are giving to the issue of name, image, and likeness and collegiate athletics. I also want to recognize Ohio Congressman Anthony Gonzalez, an Ohio State alumnus, an outstanding collegiate and professional football player for his support of student athletes and the work that he has done around this issue. Together, we can enact and implement legislation that will provide a uniform name, image, and likeness approach. I believe this action will result in fair and uniform competition for all student athletes and protect and ensure opportunities for future student athletes. Thank you. Thank you. And our next witness, I bet, likes to have her name pronounced correctly. So, Kohler. Kohler. Okay, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank Glad you, Mr. You Chairman. Us. Chairman Wicker, Ranking Member Cantwell, and members of the committee, my name is Dion Kohler, and I'm a professor of law and the director of the Center for Sport and the Law at the University of Baltimore. I'm also a former athlete and the proud parent of an NCAA Division III athlete. Thank you for inviting me here to speak with you about these important issues. For decades, Congress and courts have deferred to the NCAA to build a model for intercollegiate sports that has grown into a multi-billion dollar industry. The NCAA calls this the American model. Courts are increasingly calling it a violation of antitrust law. Today, the NCAA purports to seek legislation so that it can preserve what it defines as amateurism. In reality, it seeks to preserve the cartel profits that an unnecessarily restrictive amateurism model yields. This committee should not be moved. The action sought by the NCAA would not only cause further harm to athletes, but ultimately to the entire college sports enterprise. It is a model that is literally breaking under the weight of its own injustice. The decades of excesses and abuses perpetrated under the guise of amateurism are well known and at times have been the subject of congressional hearings and reports, including the series of reports Senator Murphy released last year. The profound unfairness of this model is even more apparent considering that it is black men, 
often from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds who disproportionately provide the labor that pays predominantly white coaches and administrators bloated above market salaries. The NCAA model, therefore, is not just an economic issue, it is increasingly a social justice issue. Today, the NCAA and college sports interests are asking Congress for even more than deference. They are asking for an unprecedented level of insulation from the free market rules that nearly every other American industry must follow. Granting this extraordinary request is not at all necessary to preserve the many benefits that intercollegiate sports provides. There is no urgency presented by this issue. While a federal solution to the name image likeness issue could be useful, competitive balance and the NCAA model are not irreparably threatened by state legislation. In addition, if any guardrails are necessary, the NCAA should not be the ones to craft them. Athletes can, like other students on campus, enter the free market and strike deals for the use of their name, image, and likeness. The only guardrails needed in this situation are those provided by federal antitrust law that would prevent the NCAA from imposing unreasonable restraints on trade in the name of amateurism. Rather than seeking protection from Congress to impose economic restraints on athletes, the NCAA should craft rules that better support athletes' health, safety, and well-being. Indeed, if athletes are currently able to sign waivers to facilitate their return to practice during a global health pandemic, they should be permitted to make deals to market their name, image, and likeness. The NCAA also asserts that NIL rights for athletes could somehow threaten the gains made by Title IX. This is surely not the case. In fact, these rights would promote and not undermine gender equity. To promote gender equity, the NCAA and its member institutions should instead focus on Title IX compliance, something that has yet to be fully realized. Perhaps most importantly, an antitrust exemption is not warranted here. The NCAA often asserts that an exemption is necessary to prevent vague, unsubstantiated predictions of harm to the amateurism model. Antitrust cases, however, have documented that the NCAA's overly restrictive rules produce very real demonstrable harm to athletes and the free market. An antitrust exemption would therefore serve to shield an industry that has struggled to demonstrate that its anti-competitive restraints on athletes in fact are fully necessary to produce college sports. Finally, this committee is well aware that unchecked power by sports regulators too often leads to cultures that harm athletes and threaten the games themselves. The example of the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee is instructive. I applaud this committee for its work to address these issues, most recently with bills such as the Equal Pay for Team USA Act. Through the important leadership of this committee, Congress has taken significant steps to protect athletes and restore confidence in the U.S. Olympic movement, and it has the opportunity to do the same for intercollegiate sports. In conclusion, in nearly every context where athletes have advanced arguments for fundamental fairness, equality, and the protection of their health and well-being, sports regulators like the NCAA have countered with dire predictions that sport itself would be threatened. The predicted harm never materializes. History has shown that initiatives which promote athletes' rights have strengthened the integrity, sustainability, and popularity of sports, and I have no doubt that allowing intercollegiate athletes the right to market their name, image, and likeness without unnecessary restriction by the NCAA will do the same. I thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Kohler. Commissioner Sankey, you're recognized, sir. Thank you, Chairman Wicker, and thank you, Ranking Member Cantwell and distinguished members of the committee. On behalf of the Southeastern Conference, I appreciate the opportunity to visit on the important topic of student-athlete name, image, and likeness. <clears throat> My name is Greg Sankey, and I've served as Commissioner of the Southeastern Conference since June of 2015. That is part of a 33-year career in college athletics, including work on a small Division III campus in upstate New York a small Division I football playing university in Natchitoches, Louisiana, being commissioner of the Southland Conference with universities in Texas and Louisiana, and now with the SEC. My objective is to share the important view that we must get this name, image, and likeness issue right in order to ensure that we are able to provide opportunities for many young women and young men, both now and in the future, and that we preserve the characteristics of college athletics that make it unique, appealing, and important to so many in our country. In reality, 
This issue presents unique and challenging complexities that can be misunderstood and may result in those unintended consequences that have been identified. And so I offer the following for your consideration. First, as we implement these NIL changes, our student athletes must remain students and not become employees of colleges and universities. We must continue to emphasize their academic progress as students, particularly as we add additional responsibilities upon an already busy schedule. Second, we must not allow college